Virginia, which is a uh, little bit based on the facts and the data rather than just the talk uh, as uh, just for the sake of the talk. Uh, I may repeat slightly a little bit uh, some of the um, aspects of uh, the uh, narrative that we heard yesterday, but please excuse me because uh, the presentation is prepared in a, in, a, in a way that I cannot just uh, avoid some parts, but I will try to be short in the uh, introduction part about the conflict, and as you heard yesterday, the conflict started in the active phase, the last phase of the conflict started in 1988, and uh, the ceasefire agreement was signed in 1994. Uh, there have been several peace packages uh, uh, proposed by the mediators to the governments uh, of the uh, conflict parties, but uh, none of these proposals has been successful. Uh, the recent package, which is named uh, Madrid Proposal, the Madrid Principles, uh, started from 2007. Uh, based on this uh, agreement, uh, there are several points, among which the return of the territories adjacent to Nagorno-Karabakh currently under Armenian control, the return of refugees and IDPs, um, uh, the interim and the final status of Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, the status of Lachin or some corridor connecting Karabakh with Armenia, and of course the security of all people living in the conflict area through supposedly a peacekeeping mission and etc. So these principles are everywhere on the internet, you can go and dig it out and uh, provide to understand what are the details, but the, de the, the details are the most important thing in this proposal because I think uh, one of our colleagues was talking about, the, about this uh, because the principles are quite well defined and developed and these principles have been there since 1992 actually uh, on one another way, in one another way, but uh, and so the Madrid pr proposals do not present something very new, very fresh. It's just that they have, uh, they have put it in a very comprehensive way but there is no clear identification where we should start from uh, is it going to be the return of territories, then the status or whatever, every party has this, uh, 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 its own understanding and as, as it is accepted in the academic world, it's called a constructive ambiguity. Everybody can present it in a way that they are interested in presenting these uh, Madrid principles and uh, apparently Azerbaijani side uh, uh, focuses on the return of territories, IDPs, and then later on the referendum and the possible referendum of plebiscite or uh, uh, or identification of the will of people as the last version in Madrid principles was standing. It wasn't even clear if it is going to be a referendum or what. So this is quite vague uh, approach. Uh, however, the, it would be really a uh, step forward if the parties were able to sign this uh, deal in Kazan in 2011. And of course they couldn't, they didn't. This was brokered by Medvedev and it uh, fortunately never happened. And of course, all the, uh, I mean, Azerbaijan was blaming Armenia for the last moment retreat and Armenians were blaming Azerbaijani for a de deconstructive approach uh, and uh, an inability to reach a deal in Kazan in 2011. So since then, the problem has even gone further. The escalation has, uh, uh, has been uh, increasing and, uh, and also there have been several developments since then in and around South Caucasus region that I will uh, talk a little bit about and then uh, try to provide also some uh, uh, insights of uh, possible conflict transformation and I, will I, and I will be speaking about conflict transformation and I hope uh, everybody uh, realizes the key difference between transformation, resolution and settlement and I will be focusing on transformation but I don't want to explain what I understand with transformation or how it is perceived. I hope uh, if there will be questions, I will uh, respond to them. So uh, five key developments that I have uh, hi highlighted since 2013-14, uh, uh, the conflict in Ukraine and annexation of Crimea by Russia, escalation of Syrian conflict leading to Russian military engagement in the region, and serious tensions between Russia and Turkey uh, after the, mi uh, the Russian military plane was gunned down by Turkish air forces. Uh, lifting of sanctions in, and in the end of 2015 uh, from Iran, which were imposed by West, by the West. Uh, and lastly, two, develop, two uh, key developments in Armenia and Azerbaijan, the constitutional reform in Armenia in 2015, and the downturn of oil prices and the following discontent in Azerbaijan in, two, in the end of 2015. Uh, and all these factors that I have, uh, of course there have been other regional developments, but I think these are the key uh, uh, that have a big impact on the Nagorno-Karabakh uh, peace process. So the conflict in Ukraine, 
Well, uh, the implications of Russian intervention in Ukraine with the annexation of Crimea uh, are still discussed among many experts in South Caucasus region. Uh, uh, the referendum held in Crimea legalizing uh, the unification move with Russia was severely criticized by international community, which made many Armenian experts uh, uh, express deep concerns about the future cooperation between Russia and U.S., in terms of the Nagorno-Karabakh peace process, because as you know, they are uh, two out of three uh, co-mediators, co-chairs of the Minsk group. However, uh, at the same time, the Minsk group co-chair, uh, the U.S. Minsk group co-chair, ex expressed his belief that despite the worsening of Russian-U.S. relations, Nagorno-Karabakh peace process is one field uh, where the U.S. and Russia can continue to work together, and I think Mr. Markedono was referring to this also, that probably uh, the, the Karabakh peace process is, is, if not the only, but one of the main areas that U.S. and Russia still uh, do not have very contradicting or controversial interests about. So hopefully uh, the conflict in Ukraine would not deepen. However, there were some criticism also in Azerbaijan, obviously, after the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, that the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict will never be solved through peaceful means, uh, and uh, only the military resolution is going to be, or military uh, change is going to be uh, the final answer to the Karabakh uh, conflict. And there were different um, anal analytical pieces in Azerbaijan and elsewhere that uh, the example of Crime Crimea was a blatant violation of international uh, law and territorial integrity. Of course, this, is, uh, this plays Azerbaijani card of Nagorno understanding of Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. And that uh, the West was applying double standards of international law for Crimea and Karabakh. And we also talked a little bit about this, about Russian interests in, in, in different frozen conflicts and how they see the change in these conflicts. Of course, they are different depending on the conflict, regardless they they, were, uh, they started uh, on the onset of the uh, uh, collapse of Soviet Union or whatever. Uh, as a result, uh, in 2014, not as a direct result from uh, Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict, but you could see the, that in 2014, the uh, escalation of violence on the line of contact of uh, Armenian Azerbaijani and Armenian Karabakh uh, frontiers uh, increased, and uh, I can bring some data if you are interested that I dug from different sources. So, according to official sources in the military uh, of uh, Ministry of Defense of Armenia, 57 deaths were recorded in the Republic of Armenia Armed Forces and Nagorno Karabakh Republic Defense Army, 38 of which were caused um, by the violation of ceasefire on the line of contact by Azerbaijan. So, uh, this, this was the data for 2015. And according to unofficial sources uh, in Armenia, the casualties, uh, the number of casualties was 76, even higher, and 41 of which occurred due to ceasefire violations. And uh, according to unofficial sources in Azerbaijan, the number of fatal casualties equaled 38 people in the first half of 2015 only, 18 of which were caused by the violation of ceasefire by the Armenian side. Of course, this data is, uh, mo uh, so the unofficial sources uh, nobody can be sure about, but still we need to talk about figures and numbers if we are talking about the number of uh, casualties or escalation on the line of contact. So this is on the line of contact and on diplomatic arena after the crisis in Ukraine, the Council of Europe prepared and introduced reports dealing with selected issues of peace process, basically favoring the Azerbaijani perception of the conflict resolution process. Uh, two reports prepared by PASE have been widely discussed among Armenian experts in Armenia and one of them was entitled uh, Escalation of Violence in Nagorno-Karabakh and other occupied territories of Azerbaijan. And as you can see, for an Armenian perspective and approach, uh, other occupied territories of Azerbaijan, including uh, Karabakh, uh, uh, it, uh, it, it is a big, big uh, issue in Armenia among public to discuss this because it is not being considered as such. At least Karabakh per se is not considered as an other occupied territory of Azerbaijan. Uh, and the, another uh, resolution was about the Sarsang water reservoir that I spoke a little bit also yesterday. And it, and it was entitled, Inhabitants of Frontier Regions of Azerbaijan are Deliberately Deprived of Water. And again, this resolution was asking the Armenian authorities to seize the use of water resources as a political tool providing water supply to frontier regions of Azerbaijan from the Sarsang water reservoir located in NK. So both reports were widely criticized in, in Armenia and because of its unilateral approach. 
and by elites and ordinary citizens, civil society, anybody. So there was no question about this. Another thing that our opposition parties in Armenia were blaming our government not being able to confront these uh, reports in, uh, in Pasa and the diplomatic failure, but they weren't blaming, they're just blaming their, in their misdeed rather than the text of the uh, proposal of the uh, report. However, in short, to cut it short, the, uh, well, Minsk Group released a statement uh, on January 22 urging Pase not to take steps which, were, which could undermine OSC Minsk Group mandate. And this was very welcomed in Armenia because uh, everybody considered, not many people in Armenia consider Minsk Group as the key player in the peace process. Uh, and it was uh, welcomed when the uh, Minsk Group uh, made this statement that, uh, of course, other institutions are free to discuss and to have any kind of reports, but it, if it harms the entire process of peace process, it's, it's better to withstand from that position. So in conclusion, even though the PASE resolutions are non-binding and do not foresee follow-up procedures with the reports uh, that are rejected, PASE still serves an important regional platform. And the uh, reports apparently were yet another setback and counterproductive, not only in terms of peace, pro peace process in general, but also the escalation of violence on the line of contact. So this is about Russia, Ukraine, and some implications that follow it, followed the uh, acute uh, stage of the conflict in Ukraine. Now turning into Russia-Turkey relations, I will try to be short. I don't know how much time I have, just indicate me five minutes? It's impossible. <laughs> anyway. Uh, the causes of the escalation in Russia-Turkey, contradicting geopolitical interests, after the Russian plane was gunned down by Turkish air forces, uh, we witnessed unprecedented violent, uh, tensions between Russia and Turkey since the collapse of the Soviet Union, actually. Uh, and many Armenians uh, backed Russia's engagement in the conflict in Syria because of two main reasons. Russia is considered to be main guarantor of Armenia's security with a Russian military base in the northern Armenian town and Gumri, and not far from Turkish border, and large Armenian community in Syria, which has historically supported Assad family rule and uh, has been fighting so far for the preservation of Assad regime. And uh, according to some Armenian experts, the increasing military engagement of the Russian armed forces in Syria will require huge resources, and Armenia may be considered, it hasn't yet, but may be considered as a potential uh, military uh, support for Russians to use the territory of the Russian base there or air air airports in Armenia, military airports, etc. Azerbaijan, on the other hand, uh, is facing serious dilemma because of this, because of Turkey-Russia resentment, uh, because of the ethnic kinship, obviously. And it tried to be neutral uh, and uh, didn't bl blame, uh, of course, naturally, uh, Turkish uh, move uh, because of different uh, connecting uh, brotherly factors. Uh, but one interesting aspect in terms of Karabakh, Nagorno-Karabakh conflict and the peace process that occurred after the Russian-Turkish uh, military escalation that the uh, Turkish Prime Minister announced, declared that uh, after that uh, the, the, the plane was gone down, that Turkey will do everything possible to liberate the occupied territories of Azerbaijan, quote unquote. So again, Karabakh conflict is being used uh, by big powers, regional powers, be it Russia or Turkey, whenever they have uh, confrontation between themselves. So another, another layer of uh, burden on, on, on Nagorno-Karabakh when the big powers have problems and the hardening of the confrontation between the different axes, Armenia, Russia, Turkey, Azerbaijan may turn Nagorno-Karabakh into another battleground, unfortunately. However, the perspective of proxy war in the South Caucasus using the NK card is hardly serving the national interests of both Armenia and Azerbaijan and, and Nagorno-Karabakh. So However, the Russian-Turkish confrontation is yet another blow. Well, Iran, Russia, and Armenia, this is another story that you know, the sanction, lifting of sanctions, new opportunities, uh, new challenges. Iran has already offered a new deal, Armenian-Iranian new energy deal of $120 million to, for the gas and oil, um, uh, new routes, and uh, using the uh, already uh, built routes to, to supply gas to uh, third countries. And, of course, it has also declared, after the sanctions were lifted, that Iran would be very much interested in joining, at some, to some extent, some, in some format of Nagorno-Karabakh peace process. And uh, many people in Armenia consider it, consider it only the Minsk group, and hence uh, Iranian engagement, if it, was, it would be possible at some point, it will be through uh, Minsk group. And now, finally, the last two um, factors, the constitutional reform in Armenia and the uh, 
situation in Azerbaijan, I think the most important ones internally. And as you know, in, in December, on December 6, 2015, there was a referendum uh, to make Armenia a parliamentary republic in uh, contrast to the current semi-presidential and the uh, referendum uh, was held on, in December and um, well, it, uh, the, according to official results, the, uh, Armenia is now a parliamentary republic but it will, be, it will uh, start, the process will start in 2017 when the next parliamentary elections will be held. Uh, the changes, however, according to main opposition uh, forces in Armenia, enabled the incumbent president to at least remain in power and have strong influence over the government after his second and final term, which would end in 2018. So for many in Armenia, uh, this move of constitutional reform was to just uh, make sure that the current regime reproduces itself um, and uh, be it uh, if the main uh, powerful uh, uh, position would be prime minister, then it is even possible that the current president will become the prime minister and continue his rule as a ruler of the party, Republican Party, very similar to what was the uh, Central Committee of Soviet Union uh, uh, during Soviet Union times were doing. There, there was a nominal uh, head of the parliament, but of course the ruler was the uh, party chief. Uh, so different civil society organizations raised deep concerns about the proposed changes including the Eastern Partnership Civil Society Forum, Armenia's National Platform, Transparency International, Helsinki Citizens Assembly, they all uh, raise deep concerns because uh, they have reports indicating that the reform the referendum uh, was actually uh, rigged and it, there were several, uh, well, multiple occasions of frauds and uh, I mean the, this does not represent the real will of people according to the civil society organizations. Uh, the results suggested that the peaceful change of political elite in Armenia would be more and more unlikely. The current regime will remain in power, often manipulating the unresolved Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, consolidating support around the small group of people in power, currently marginalizing opponents. The ruling regime does not have any incentive, this is my understanding, does not have any incentive to change the status quo in Nagorno-Karabakh conflict which will presumably change the political paradigm causing serious threat to own political capital because their political capital is built on the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Therefore, as, a, as long as the regime remains in the power, it is hardly possible to envisage peaceful resolution of any conflict. And finally, uh, but very important, the downturn of oil prices in Azerbaijan and the discontent there. Uh, this is, we are not able to travel to Azerbaijan and have our observations there, so this is all uh, coming from the reports and newspaper pieces, uh, internet pieces. From. And similar to our Armenia regime in Azerbaijan also accumulated much of its political capital from NK conflict. Mm, the authorities in Azerbaijan frequently use the NK conflict to neutralize democratic pra practices inside the country and silence political opposition and socially active groups. Starting from 2013, the regime initiated a serious crackdown of civil society, uh, blaming many prominent political public figures in conspiracy against uh, uh, spying for Armenia. Uh, dozens of others, including political activists, journalists, civil society activists, have been uh, arrested and imprisoned on uh, supposedly fake charges. In the Human Rights Watch report tightening the screws, Azerbaijan crackdown on civil society in dissent, the author summarized the situation in Azerbaijan uh, recording, uh, Azerbaijan's record on freedom of expression, um, assembly and association being on a steady decline and dramatically deteriorating since mid-2012 when the government has been engaged in a, a concerted effort to curtail opposition political activity. This is quote unquote the Human Rights Watch report. So tightening the grip on civil society using the NK card apparently secures regime's aspirations to stick to power. However, the downturn of economic indicators connected with the significant decline of, decline of oil prices in the end of 2015 puts the regime in a very fragile situation. Uh, there have been reports that protests with participation of several thousands people were held in different parts of Azerbaijan against price hikes and devaluation of national currency. We have five minutes now. Uh, the national currency plummeted in December by further 32%. Uh, in the same months, consumer prices rose several times, leaving many with no other option than go out to the streets. In parallel to the protests in Azerbaijan, the line of contact confrontation, this is interesting, in the NK conflict decreased significantly compared to the similar periods prior to the protests. 
In fact, in January 2016, for instance, there were only a few violations of ceasefire with no fatal casualties. In, as you could see, perhaps there could be some uh, connection with the protests and the Azerbaijani uh, regime being busy with internal developments rather than NK front. In, in the short run, the domestic protests in Azerbaijan might have calmed down uh, the front line, uh, front line altercations. However, in the long run, uh, long run, it is more realistic that the situation will deteriorate, deteriorate much worse. Okay. And as proved previously, domestic issues create fertile grounds for line of contact confrontation to distract public attention, attention from internal economic and social issues in Azerbaijan. Therefore, the, the Azerbaijan may have a reason to further escalate the long-standing NK conflict. With this regard, it will be important for the international community to restrict, uh, to restrict the regime's possible desire to stir up the situation on the line of contact in the coming months, given the socio-economic situation, situation in Azerbaijan may deteriorate further. So these have been the five factors that were uh, negatively influencing the Nagorno-Karabakh peace process. If you want, I can stop here, but I also wanted to provide some oversight and overview of uh, per public perceptions and how these public perceptions have been shaped based on these developments also. So if you give me just one minute, I will try to show some maps and some figures about the relationship between Armenia and Azerbaijan. If you don't want, I can, I can uh, stop, and maybe I'll, I'll have another opportunity to speak <laughs> about this. Yes, I, I think you have in the afternoon the opportunity to speak on the tables uh, about this because we have a lot of other speakers and they need also their time. I wanted so to make everything very also visual uh, because <laughs> nobody did this, but okay, no problem. Thank you. No, but perhaps there are some questions for, from oh, the okay. yeah, please. public. Yeah, please, please ask some questions so I can use the opportunity to speak more. Yes. <laughs> please. Okay, okay, uh, uh, thank you. <laughs> any, 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 Is more? There any other comment or question? Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so uh, maybe I will start uh, with your uh, question and request. I, I just uh, accumulated some data from the CRRC surveys of Caucasus Barometer. It is called very, very short, yeah, Caucasus Research Resource Centers in Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia, they do Caucasus bar Barometer Annual Surveys. And as you can see, this is the, uh, like for the main enemy of Armenia, you see the results, yeah, Azerbaijan and Turkey, this is the public opinion. I mean, you can still distrust the way of doing uh, r surveys in Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia, but how else are you going to provide some information uh, if it is not about data and figures? So this is one, way that you can uh, prove your argumentation using this data. And the main enemy of uh, Azerbaijan, as you can see, is like uh, more than 95% is considered to be Armenia. In Armenia, it's just divided between, uh, not divided, most partly, mostly are Azerbaijan and then also Turkey. Some other uh, parameters here, uh, if approval of doing business with Azerbaijan is in Armenia, as you can, uh, as you can see, uh, disapproval has been uh, going up uh, since 2011 and 2012, and uh, it's even uh, more people considered disapproved now doing business with Azerbaijan than it was back in 2000, yet in 2011. In, our, in Azerbaijan, I mean, it's, it's, it's within the margin of error. I mean, it's almost 100% nobody approves. I mean, this is, the, this is, this is the, the point that you could assume that how it is being done, that it is 100%. No survey can be, no referendum can be 100%, but still. Um, the peaceful and military resolution opportunities for Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Uh, this is the situation, uh, the picture in Armenia. As you can see, have Nagorno-Karabakh in Azerbaijan without autonomy, only 1% uh, favors this in Armenia, which is again margin of error, but there are interesting data. I can share this da data later on with you if you're interested because we don't have much time for this. And in Azerbaijan, you could see a totally uh, uh, mirror picture uh, the other way around. The, the, the transformation of maps, very interesting, that was happening uh, starting from 2011 in Armenia and 2012. Initially, you could find maps like this uh, in, in Armenia on private, public, on private or state-owned uh, platforms. Gradually, it shifted towards this kind of maps, which not only Karabakh, but also seven territories around are controlled by Armenia. And also indicating that uh, Shaomian region and some part of Martoni is still under Azerbaijani control, not within Enkau previously, but Armenian densely populated, 
Another map, very interesting map uh, that you can find on uh, Orange uh, Mobile Communicator in Yerevan. You see, it is again presented. The picture is like with uh, territories, but th some somebody just throw some paint on these territories. This is a map in Armenia on a main street in in, in Armenia. So there are these kind of interesting developments in terms of maps. This is another map. Uh, so I can talk a little bit after.